So I am going to get talking a little bit about how to optimize your recovery. We're going to debunk a few myths and give you a few tips. Uh, so just to start off, my name is Paul Coviello. I'm a board certified clinical specialist in orthopedic physical therapy, uh, and I, I love research. So I'm probably going to talk a little bit about a lot of research regarding recovery today. Uh, I love to cheat, treat cyclists and all sorts of athletes, as well as anybody with just about any injury that might walk through the door when it comes to orthopedics. Uh, when I was in high school, I played football, hockey, and lacrosse and continued my career for football at Ithaca. And uh, today I continue my athletics with weight training and cycling. So uh, recovery is important for me. And these are some things that I definitely apply to my life as well. So we're going to start off addressing recovery myths, and please do me a favor and don't shoot the messenger when I talk about these things. Uh, sometimes they're a bit controversial. So I like to refer to things in, in terms of a recovery pyramid, right? Talking about these big, important items at the bottom of, build, of the pyramid that build a very solid base to everything that you need to do above there. Right. So uh, a physical therapist named Adam Meekins created this pyramid originally. So I have to give him some credit. Uh, I'm just going to talk about it in terms of some things that I use myself. So the base of your pyramid is nutrition and hydration. I'm going to deep dig a little bit deeper into each one of these rungs of the pyramid uh, at, at, during the lecture here, but I'll start by telling you each one. The next after nutrition and hydration is going to be your passive recovery. So that's going to be things like sleeping and napping and reading and listening to music, watching a film and socializing, right? Uh, the next most important thing would be active recovery. So that's maybe getting out for a light bike ride or, you know, if you're a football player going for a walk at the day after a game, or if you're a weightlifter, maybe getting into the gym and just walking on the treadmill for an hour. Uh Next after that would be body work. So this is something that people really often view as one of the most important rungs of their recovery, maybe going out and getting a massage or foam rolling or stretching. And they'd say that that would be the most important thing to their recovery when, as you can see, we've already listed a few things that we would say are more important. Then above that, we'd say adjuncts. So things like electric stimulation or cryotherapy or compression sleeves or compression boots. And then getting into some gimmicks, some things that don't really guarantee any impact on your performance or recovery, like foam rolling and tempering. And maybe some these days talking about vibration guns and other gadgets that we might purchase. Um, I know the, this is when I start to ruffle some feathers here, but we'll explain more in a bit why it's important to not uh, rely on these things in for your recovery. They're good as an adjunct, but you want to make sure you check off some other boxes first. So I want to start talking about how feel good and fix are two different things. So I use this a lot with physical therapy, especially with patients who say they feel better with something like foam rolling, but their pain comes back. Now, I know that we're talking about recovery and not uh, necessarily pain in this lecture, but at the same time, this is equally as applicable for recovery as it is pain, right? So something like foam rolling or stretching might make you feel a lot better, which has its value. Please understand that feeling good has a ton of value, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be recovered because you did this and you feel better. Your, your body still might not have enough juice in the tank, or you may not ready be able to put out the maximal effort the next day just because you did something like stretch for 30 minutes after your last workout. So something more important than some of those feel good things would be your nutrition and hydration. Now, most would argue, and I would definitely say myself that nutrition and hydration make me feel great when I eat well. And when I make sure I have the adequate amount of water and I refill my body with water after I work out, that's, that's the one that's easy to forget. Um, you're going to recover a lot more efficiently. So that's going to be the increase, the speed of your recovery, as well as how, how ready you are for the next, uh, workout or event that you have. So I'm not going to speak on nutrition in very detailed specifics because it's highly variable for every athlete. But, uh, some things to make sure you do is that you have some type of nutrition pre-exercise, your intra-workout, and post-exercise. 
uh, making sure you have consistent nutrition through these different times is very important to make sure you're prepared to perform. So you might think of recovery as only things that you do in your downtime, but even making sure you have uh, proper nutrition during your exercise will make sure that you can recover faster afterwards, right? So setting yourself up to recover is probably as important as the recovery itself later. Um, Post-exercise, you definitely want to make sure you include protein. I would say protein, protein, protein. It's the building blocks to our body. Um, I don't like to immediately step on anyone's diet, but a lot of vegetarian and plant-based diets are very difficult to get the adequate protein you need for any type of athletics. Um, It will work for some people. And I cannot, I can't go against that. Sometimes it's the best diet for some people, but uh, it is very challenging to get the adequate protein you need to perform at a high level when not taking in um, meat or dairy. Those are the most bioavailable proteins that you can get to help your body rebuild. There's some very interesting research out there that skipping breakfast will hurt your performance later in the day. So you can think that what you're doing before your exercise is technically recovery from your last exercise. So you need to make sure you feed yourself in the morning. So maybe your workout at three, four, five, six o'clock is more optimized, right? And every time we want to be optimized to make sure we make the greatest improvements that we can every time we're in the gym, on the bike, on the field, whatever it might be. Um, Next thing is just talking about hydration, and this is going to be very, very variable for each person, how much you need to drink. So I can't just say that there's some fixed amount that you need to drink. Um, You you need to drink enough to feel good, and you need to really spread it out throughout the day. There's only so much water you can absorb in one shot, right? Um, This is super important to know because you might say, oh, you know, I didn't drink anything during my workout at all, and then I got home and I – drank three bottles of water, and then you had to run to the bathroom a few times more than you normally would, and you didn't really retain as much of that water as you intended to. So uh, spacing out, I think, is the most important thing. Um, Some other really interesting things is that skim milk after a workout is actually particularly good at rehydrating you. Um, I'm not going to say for other reasons that it's going to be the ideal thing, but you can drink skim milk and it may be more beneficial than water. Uh, In theory, that's because there's some sugar in it and getting the sugar will help your cells retain some of that water. Uh, Interesting little facts. Hydration drinks are good as well, anything with electrolytes, but um, again, beyond the scope of really what I want to talk about, just make sure that you're getting your hydration in. So next thing that's really important that's really often overlooked is your passive recovery. So this is going to include your sleep, your time off. Um, making sure you work on mindset. And then I'm going to discuss the details of this and exactly what it is, but your sympathetic versus your parasympathetic balance. And uh, I know those are big words, but you will know exactly what that is in just a couple minutes. Uh, First thing we'll be talking about your time off. And this is crazy, especially because in a lot of sports, people love what they do and they want to continue to do it and they don't particularly want to stop. So maybe you want to work out every day. But especially with endurance athletes, less than two days of rest will increase your risk of injury by 5.2 times. So do understand that that is just a risk. It's not a guarantee by any means. But um, consider those off days and understand that they're very valuable in reducing your risk of further injury. Um, Reducing risk of injury is very important for recovery, right? It's very hard to recover and do what you want to do if you are injured. And a lot of recovery is to avoid injury. Otherwise we would just do things all day long. The next thing is sleep. Uh, I found it interesting that talking about nutrition and hydration was at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, I would agree that you need that to feel your, feel yourself, but it's really hard to say that sleep is uh, not right there in line with those. So anytime you sleep less than eight hours, you have a 1.7 times greater injury risk than if you slept more than eight hours. That's a decent chunk. Um, I know it's really hard to get your sleep, but uh, if you kind of go down the list, they, uh, they, they did a study looking at athletes for a 21-month period and then their likelihood of injury based on the hours slept. So you had an 18% chance at some point in that 21 months if you slept about nine hours a night, right? 
it jumps all the way up to 35% with only eight hours. Then from there to 62, near, nearly doubling with only seven hours of sleep. And then you go up to 74 at six hours. So you can see here that your, your body's healing, repairing itself, able to use that protein that you're intaking, able to make good use of the hydration that you have in your body to heal itself and be ready for the next activity that you're going to take in the more sleep that you get. All right. Um, for, for all of us here, it's also not going to be every night. Don't beat yourself up that you get a bad night of sleep here and there. That's going to happen to the best of us. It, it's it's really easy to get into a conversation, oh, some nights I just couldn't sleep that night. I could only get five hours in. Um, and that's that's totally fine. But really it's less – it's more about the average of your sleep than each individual night. So averaging less than seven hours over two weeks uh, had a 51% increase of your injury risk. And then more importantly, another thing to understand is you might have weeks when you don't sleep – a, a tremendous amount, but understand during that time, you probably don't want to increase your training load. So you have two times the injury risk when your training load increases, when your sleep decreases. Uh, very important to understand because especially uh, in when there's adults or maybe you're, you're a student and you have a big test coming up the next week, you want to make sure, okay, well, I had to study. There's things I have to do. I, I had a big uh, presentation to put together for work. I didn't get a lot of sleep this week. Probably not the week to pick up your marathon training or training for your century or not the week to start your new weightlifting program. So some tips to improve your sleep would be first to create a routine and a ritual, uh, something that you do nightly so that your body starts to really understand that you're getting into the sleep habit. Uh, number two would be to have a quiet, dark, and cool bedroom. Uh, these things all will improve the quality of sleep once you are asleep. Make sure your bed is for sleep and intimacy only. And then you want to avoid caffeine and alcohol before bed. Uh, there's a lot of different information about how long you would want to avoid this for, but um, uh, you can look into that yourself. But those are things that you, you want to make sure you cut off a little bit earlier in the day to avoid affecting your sleep. You want to avoid blue light devices, lights, all different sorts of things. Make sure you have some time where your eyes get a chance to relax. And then uh, I found this one very interesting and I started incorporating to my life when I was putting this uh, lecture together, but you want to get natural light as soon as you wake up. Uh, your body's very responsive to light and especially natural light. If you can get that, you're going to wake up quicker, which gets you into a better sleeping rhythm, which is part of your routine and ritual, right? And then we wake up right away. We're ready for sleep that night when we get back to bed. Uh, we don't want to be hitting the snooze button, which is another tip for you, right? That's going to throw you. Sorry, my, my connection might have been lost for a quick second there. Um, you want to make sure you don't fall asleep to the TV, especially because of that sound and noise, something very important for yourselves. And you want to reduce your fluid intake directly before going to bed. That'll help you out a decent chunk. So... I want to talk about this parasympathetic and sympathetic balance that I spoke of before. So you can think of that as your fight and flight, um, fight and flight system, which is your sympathetic system, and your rest and digest system, which is your parasympathetic system. So basically, it's kind of like ready to go, ready to fight, maybe ready to ride or lift weights, right? You got to get charged up to go and do the training you need to do. Or maybe you're prior to a soccer match and you're on the, on the field with your teammates and you know that feeling that comes up and you get those tingles. That's a lot of your fight and flight response. Um, your parasympathetic response is your rest and digest. This is, you know, right before you go to bed, you can feel you maybe melt into the couch. Uh, maybe you're joking around with a couple friends, uh, telling, uh, listening to a funny movie or a funny podcast or something that just gets you to calm down a bit, right? And you, we all know that feeling where a lot of our muscle tension is decreased and we feel a lot more relaxed. We need to be able to toggle between these two states as any type of athlete, even if you're, uh, even if you just go to the gym three times a week because you like to, you need to be able to shut off your body's fight and flight response. Super important for a lot of things in life, but particularly your recovery. Uh, you'll process nutrients better. You'll digest your food better. You'll get to sleep better. You'll be able to uh, help manage stress a little bit better when you can control those responses. So even just understanding those states is very important. 
from there, um, I want to talk about how that relates to mindset, right? So your, your mindset is hard to manage. And again, this is not quite my expertise ex- expertise on um, managing mindset. If, if it's something that's more of a clinical issue for you, that there are professionals that specialize in that. But uh, a few things is if you're constantly keyed up in stress, you're going to have a hard time toggling between that sympathetic and parasympathetic response, right? Um Maybe if it's more on the on the depression side, when we're talking clinically, you're going to have a hard time getting up, right, and getting your fight and flight going to get done what you need to get done, right? Um, more often than not, people have a, more of a difficulty getting into their rest and digest. So talking about there with, you know, stress management, which is going to cause some – yeah, stress will cause narrowing of your attention, some general distraction, increased self-consciousness, and, and all those things will interfere with your performance, whether that's focus on training or a game or a competition or whatever it might be. Um, stress will also increase your muscle tension, which is going to limit performance, right? Um, in order to be a high-level athlete of any type, you need to be able to relax muscles equally as well as you generate that force. And having uh, a poor ability to have that balance in the body puts you at higher risk for injury and also will limit your performance. Uh, stress is also shown to increase your injury risk slightly. So having some of these techniques I'm going to speak about here to manage stress will help you. And you consider incorporating some of these things into your recovery to be the best athlete you can be and really taking a holistic approach. So cognitive based techniques. So things working on your mind itself, uh, things like thought stopping, not letting yourself go down, uh, um, a darker trail of thought, right? Uh, thought replacement and imagery, replace more negative thoughts with positive thoughts. Think you're on the beach with a Corona in your hand. Bad joke for the time, but uh, maybe make that a margarita if you enjoy it. Um, and then some positive self-talk. You can do it. Things are good. You're strong. You got this. We're going to be better, right? Tomorrow's going to be a better day. Um, somatic-based techniques, things that you can do with your body to reduce some of those stress levels. And I know a lot of us use exercise to reduce our stress levels, but if you do that too much as a coping mechanism, you're not going to be able to recover enough to perform, right? So something you can do to really bring yourself down and into a great recovery state is slow, deep, and centered breathing. So it's great for stress management, also great for your recovery, really good um, to practice your breathing patterns, really good to, when you're conscious of that, you can even treat that as meditation. I, I don't know about you guys, but focusing on some, you know, abstract thought that might be um, a little bit out there for meditation is very difficult for me. But if I spend 10 minutes focusing on the quality of my breath, I might do a little bit better and notice afterwards that my mind wasn't straying to a million different things. Um, I really love another technique called progressive muscle relaxation. So maybe thinking, okay, relax your forehead, relax your eyes, relax your mouth, work all the way down the body, all the way to the tips of the toes. There's a few great YouTube videos out there that you can listen to that guide you through this. And this is very good at creating some of that muscle relaxation that we talked about. Last are some uh, cognitive behavioral techniques, literally trying to alter how you go about doing these things. And uh, that would be goal setting. And then lastly, if, if you do need clinical help with it, seeking someone to work on stress management training. And sometimes that's an option if it's something that's getting in the way of your life. And I, I do recommend that for folks if need be. So low, low intensity workouts are really overlooked. I really wish people would do more of them. Sometimes that that active recovery days was the most important and most beneficial day of your week, right? Maybe you're a cyclist. Maybe you need to ride at the lowest heart rate you could possibly keep yourself. You, you avoid any kind of hill. I know you might even be saying that's great, right? Maybe you're a weightlifter and you just need to go in and sit on the recumbent bike and just chill for 30 minutes or an hour. This is super important for getting blood to the muscles. You can massage as much as you want. You can go in an infrared sauna as much as you want. You can do all these newfangled techniques that are claiming they're good at getting blood to your muscles, but there's no better way to get blood to a muscle than to make it lightly exercise, not to the point of fatigue, not to the point where you feel like you're really even exerting anything, but exercise it enough that your body requires it to get blood flow to it. You will flush out any kind of cellular waste, a lot of that soreness, as well as all the protein gets carried to the muscles via blood. 
if you want it to heal, you want to improve everything, you need to get that blood flow. Super important for yourself. Next rung on the pyramid is going to be body work. So this is where the stretching, massage, and mobility work play in. And I previously gave a lecture on stretching and mobility work. Um, so I'm going to touch on a couple of the things that I already talked about. So if this is a, re, uh, a recap for people, that'll be great. Um, but stretching is talked about by a lot of people that I, I know, a lot of my patients, a lot of friends, family, um, people that think it might be the greatest thing that they've ever done or it makes them feel great. And I don't want to discount that. But I do want to give you some information uh, about what stretching can do and what it can't do. So what it does do, it will acutely improve your range of motion. It might improve your range of motion for a very short period of time. Uh, it's very hard to actually make flexibility improvements with stretching. I know, crazy. But the truth is, no matter how hard you try, the likelihood of you actually getting more flexible from stretching is relatively low. You might do it, but still low, okay? It will improve your tolerance to stretching. The more you stretch, the better you get at stretching. It'll also provide some short-term feel good. You're usually not going to like stretch something and then that was the end of it. It might provide some relief for a short period of time, but it's not going to have a lot of carryover. Things that stretching doesn't do. It's not going to reduce your risk for injury. One study showed it only reduced your injury risk by 4%, which is a really small amount. To put that in comparison to something like strength training, which reduces your injury risk by 69%, that's a tremendous difference there. Uh, stretching doesn't mechanically lengthen muscles. So a lot of people's goal with stretching, I know sometimes it's just to feel better, but a lot of times it's to become more flexible. Unfortunately, it's not particularly great at actually making your muscles longer. In order to lengthen your muscles, you need to add cells, which are called sarcomeres. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of prolonged force. We're talking hours upon hours of force to add those sarcomeres. Strengthening is actually really great at adding those sarcomeres. Um, stretching, not quite as much. More strength training through a full range of motion, right? Like almost like strengthening into a stretch as opposed to just kind of holding a stretch for a while. Um, and the last thing stretching doesn't do is lead to any kind of improvement in performance. Sometimes it's actually a detriment to performance. If you, if you stretch prior to working out, you might actually show a drop in strength. So you might be asking at this point, should I still stretch? And I say probably not. Uh, if, if you do have time to waste, stretching would be great. If you don't have time to waste, then there are a lot better ways to stay healthy and improve your performance as well as recover better. So um, if you want to look at like most important things for keeping yourself well at, for any sport, whether that be an endurance sport or a strength sport or explosive or dance or soccer or you name it, the most important thing you should focus on is strength. That, that's an unfortunate truth that a lot of people don't want to accept, but the stronger you are, the more you're going to be able to do and the less you're going to need to recover from it. Next thing is endurance. Endurance is basically just how many times you can replicate that strength. If you're not strong, you can't have endurance. Then you want to work on your endurance, how many times you can do, do something with that strength that you've built up. Next thing from there is you want to have great mobility, right? Mobility is a little different than flexibility. Mobility is basically how far you can move it yourself, right? So with a pitcher, my flexibility, I can crank my wrist all the way back here. My mobility, I can only move it to here. I'm trying as hard as I can, but I can push it a lot further than I can move it with my own muscles. Mobility, active, flexibility, how far I can force it, all right? That mobility is probably going to be a lot more important to your sports performance and also how you feel after you do things than how far you can really yank on your body. So another really interesting thing is that uh, there was a pretty interesting study looking at resistance training, strength training, right, for improving your flexibility versus stretching. And at the end of the study, they figured out that they were actually equal, right? So if you wanted to improve your range of motion, neither were particularly phenomenal at improving it, but the strength training worked just as well as your stretching. So if you're looking to kind of get a dual benefit here, right? Maybe some body weight exercise, like a, like a split squat or a deep lunge, if you're trying to work on your hamstrings, or maybe a straight legged deadlift would be way more effective for you than a hamstring stretch itself. Um, just some food for thought. Uh, 
going into some of the other bodywork things like massage, uh, massage has its value. It probably has uh, more benefit for the sympathetic and parasympathetic balance that we spoke about. Um, for some reason, a lot of human to human contact uh, and especially skin to skin has a really re uh, relaxing effect on the body. So a lot of that relaxation may be beneficial to one's recovery. You're, you're definitely not breaking up any scar tissue, which is crazy or really breaking up knots or anything like that. It's more of a relaxation effect as opposed to a mechanical uh, breaking something. If if you broke something, you're probably putting more force through the back of your legs when you sit down and you're not really breaking anything up when you do that. Um, your, your body's tissues are a lot more resilient. So understanding that some of this relaxation effect is going to be more beneficial. And then when we use it in that manner, we're probably going to be able to apply it better for our performance. The massage may increase your blood flow. Um, again, not as good as the active exercise, but it may be something else that you throw in after you've checked off all these other boxes. And uh, the massage also can improve uh, flexibility in an acute time period. So maybe for 20 minutes to an hour after a massage, some of your muscles may be more relaxed, so you might be more flexible, but that won't uh, have any kind of carryover until your muscles are stronger to tolerate that stretch. And then uh, everything after here is where there's no guarantee it's going to have a good effect on your recovery. Everything that we've talked about previously is are, are really like the bread and butter of what you should do. Um, they're the things that have hard evidence and practice that is what's going to make you better and what most professional athletes spend most of their time doing. From here, it's talking about more gimmicky things and things that kind of get thrown in that might make you feel good or have a great effect on your brain. And that, that feel good effect is going to benefit you, especially when we talk about things like that sympathetic and parasympathetic response, right? It, if you feel more calm after you uh, roll on a foam roller and it makes your muscles feel more relaxed, that has a ton of benefit. But in isolation, that is not a great recovery technique. So some of these, you know, adjuncts, things that we can add in is uh, one of them might be cryotherapy. Um, an interesting thing about it is that there, there's even been some studies that show it decreases the rate of protein synthesis, which is pretty interesting, right? You, you know, you're, you're doing something because maybe for a few minutes afterwards, you might get a pain or a muscle soreness relieving effect, but you're, you're being slightly counterproductive because you're slowing down the rate at which your body can um, proce process that protein as well as get blood flow and clear inflammation. That inflammation has some benefit. Obviously, you don't want a tremendous amount of it. Too much not good. Some, it's actually, it's actually phenomenal, right? You want some because that inflammation is a signal to the body that it needs to rebuild, right? Um, it's a normal thing that happens. That's why when you get a cut, maybe it gets red, right? When you break down a little bit of muscle tissue, you get a minor amount of inflammation and that's a signal in the body to heal. That's why we need these other um, techniques that we previously talked about to recover to make sure our body has time to do that the way it's designed to. Uh, really frequently people buy electric stimulation units or they're used in physical therapy or chiropractic clinics. And uh, really, truly, if you enjoy this, please do it. If it's something you find benefit, please don't stop doing it, but don't use it in place of any solid um, recovery technique because it pretty much just feels good. Um, most of the research on muscle stimulation shows that it might have some pain relieving effect while it's on you. And then once it's off of you, it doesn't have a particularly long lasting effect. So if you like it and it's fun for you, that, that would be great. Um, remember that placebo can have benefit. If it makes you feel better because you like it, that has benefit. But aside from that, don't expect any kind of like magic tricks from using some electric current to shock yourself. Um, from there, uh, com compression boots and sleeves are a, a really new trend going on. And it's, it's, I think it's very cool because it makes people feel better. Uh, it does improve your perceived fatigue, but it won't improve your performance. So, you know, let's say they threw compression boots, the ones that blow up on somebody, they had a really hard workout after they're out of them, their muscles feel more sore. But if you retested, I don't know how high they could jump or um, how much weight they could squat, it wouldn't be like their performance was suddenly improved because their legs feel better. But it does have a great job, um, a great ability to reduce your perceived soreness. And if that's something you're looking for, compression would be something that might be nice to add into your routine. 
Um, things that are more gimmicky that are, are not going to have any kind of long-term effect. They might have some type of feel good or offloading would be things like taping techniques, um, vibrating guns. I've used the vibrating guns myself. I do really like the way it feels. Um, it can have a short-term effect again in improving your range of motion and some muscle soreness, but unless it's combined with something else to um, reinforce that and make some type of long-term change, it's not going to have a big impact on your recovery. Um, foam rollers, they, they're a little bit overused in my opinion. They're, they're a good adjunct. They're a good lever to do some mobility work over or replace if you can't get a regular massage. But at the same time, I think they're they're used in place of real recovery techniques far far too often, and I've said that a ton of times already. But I, I hope that that gets reinforced well here. 